Tonight I'm going to try to respond to some questions that students have had um, recently about why we use more circles to begin with. So this video is why use a more circle to represent the stress that a rock uh, might be undergoing. So the first thing I want you to understand about a more circle is that a more circle is a representation of a representation of the real thing. So uh, the way that I think about this, and I know it'll seem kind of juvenile, but you know, you can write the word cat, right? And you write those things that they're, they're letters, but in your brain, you're, you're seeing a cat, right? It's, it's translated in your brain to, to becoming, you know, this. Mm. Little cat, right? Sorry, it's not a great cat. But, you know, you, you read these letters. They were a representation of this picture that you saw in your head or in this, you know, this cartoon. And that is also a representation. The sketch is a representation of a real cat, which I'm not, not a good enough artist to draw. Um... But you know, you know what a real cat is. So it's so you're losing something in translation along the way. So I want that metaphor to stick in your head when when you start thinking about why using a more circle. Well, it's because it's a representation of this representation. So a more circle is a representation of a block diagram, and we use that block diagram to represent what a rock is feeling in terms of stress at some point in a real situation. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna roll with that idea. We're gonna take a look at a block diagram first. So I've got a block and I want to understand what types of stress this uh, this block is feeling, this little piece of rock. So I'm gonna think about that in terms of the normal stresses that I might be feeling. And I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with this example of kind of the center of a mountain belt. So I'll do some compressive stresses. Make them different lengths, different magnitudes. Okay, and those are normal, so they're 90 degrees to the edges of that block diagram. And then there's also going to be some shear stresses. So these are stresses that are acting. Um, along the direction of the sides of that plane, the sides of that um, block diagram. And the rule with um, shear stresses gener generally is that um, shear stresses that would deform something in a clockwise rotation are positive. So like this shear stress up here, that's a positive shear stress. This one down here is going to be a positive shear stress. This one's negative, and this one's negative. And just take your hand if you want to, and imagine turning turning this in the direction of the arrows, and you'll see that this one and this one move it clockwise, and this one and this one would rotate the block diagram counterclockwise. So I'm going to do clockwise positive. <coughs> and um, remember, this is going to represent kind of our our real world. Right? So we've got shear stress and a normal stress. Okay, now at this point, what I don't want you to start equating is this normal stress with a principal stress. So sometimes we, we use a block diagram to represent the principal stresses, but that's not what we're doing here. We're just drawing a, a possible scenario. So we've got a block diagram, and we want to know what's going on um, inside here. What, what's the rock feeling? So to do that, we're going to think about what's going on on these sides. And we could call them A and B. So we don't need to worry about these two because this side is feeling the same thing as A and this side over here is feeling the same thing as B. So we're not going to worry about that. So your professor might give you um, the normal stress associated with B and the shear stress associated with B. 
and they might give you the um, normal stress and shear stress associated with A. Now for A, the shear stress is going to be positive, and for B, it's going to be negative. Um, so they're going to plot a little bit differently when we go to do the representation. Okay, so now let's work on representing these. Now, I, I haven't given these exact values. Your, your professor will if they ask you to do this, but um, the normal stress for A, uh, we drew it in as being shorter. So let's say that it's a little bit less. And we know that tau is positive. Okay. So I'm just going to pick a point here, and we'll call it A. Now B is going to have the same uh, magnitude but opposite sense of shear stress as A. Okay, and you can see that from the block diagram. But it has a greater um, normal stress magnitude, and we knew that because I drew this arrow a little bit longer. So, I'm just going to draw B in down here. Okay, so now what you would do to draw your Mohr circle is you're going to take your ruler and connect A and B. Okay, and that's going to cross over the x axis. And I should note that we're going to do, we're doing this as compression positive. So, this positive side of the x axis is compression. Okay, so now that I've got A and B, the first thing I want you to notice is that they're 180 degrees apart. But up here, A and B are 90 degrees apart. One of the most common questions that I get as a structure TA is why do we plot two theta? Well, it's because in the same way that going from cat to a picture of a cat, something changes in translation, Going from a block diagram to a Mohr circle, something changes in translation, and that's that this side A and B that are 90 degrees apart here end up plotting 180 degrees apart over here. So going from 90 to 180 we multiply by 2, and all of the angles up here are going to have to be multiplied by 2 down here. So then what you have your students do, or what you guys are going to do, is you're going to label the center of your circle your mean stress, and then you're going to use your compass to draw the rest of that Mohr circle in. Okay. Now, the reason why a Mohr circle is also so valuable is that it's giving us the chance to graphically represent the relationship between normal stress and shear stress. And that's going to help us visualize or conceptualize how those things are going to change in concert with each other. Okay. So let's get my little green square okay and it's gonna it's a the same size as what we were dealing with before it's got a and b labeled and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put it in the stress environment so here I've got Sigma 1 and Sigma 3 labeled and I'm just gonna put down um, sorry I put the camera down labeled and over here um, it looks like you know, here's sigma 1, here's sigma 3. Looks like B, if this is 2 theta, that might be, let's see if that's about 90, there's 45, so maybe 30. This might be 30 degrees. So that makes me think that theta is about 15. So that means that the angle between sigma 1 and B is about 15 degrees. So I've got the normal to B, and I'm going to rotate this to where that's probably about 15 degrees to sigma 1. Okay. Here's my sigma 1, here's the normal to B, about 15 degrees. Okay. So this is the actual stress scenario that we were representing with that Mohr circle. This is how the, the block is actually rotated with respect to sigma 1 and sigma 3. Now you can imagine <coughs> if we rotate A and B just a little bit, 15 degrees. Now A and B are lined up with sigma 1 and sigma 3. 
or sigma 1 and sigma 3 are perpendicular to the sides A and B. Okay, so what that would be like on this Mohr circle is if we took A and B and we rotated them by that 15 degrees and now B moves up and it's located at sigma 1, which means sigma 1 is the X component of B, and A has moved down, so now sigma 3 is the X component of A. And you can look at this and see the same thing. So sigma 1 has become the perpendicular or the X component of B, sigma 3 has become the perpendicular or the X component of A. Okay, so now let's think about um, maximum shear stress, right? Maximum shear stress on the Mohr circle happens right there, so where the where the y coordinate is the greatest, right? But it's really also happening down here. So imagine taking A and B, they're in the line between A and B, and like a little baton rotating it this way. So now the x-coordinate, or the perpendicular component um, that goes out to A and B, is going to be the mean stress. So let's see why that works over here. We're going to rotate A and B. such that um, we've got the corners lined up with sigma 1 and sigma 3 and the perpendiculars of A and B are 45 degrees to sigma 1, so maximum shear stress. And if you imagined pulling this corner in this direction and this corner in this direction and pushing sigma 3 in that direction, you can see how you would get the most deformation from shear stress, or the most shear stress going on um, in this scenario where A and B are rotated 45 degrees to sigma 1. So <coughs> if you really want to understand what makes a Mohr circle so powerful, then you've got to use it together with a block diagram and think about how that block diagram rotates in space and how that's represented um, on this Mohr circle. But don't give it, don't, you know, buy in completely with the Mohr circle and believe that it will tell you everything. Because remember, it's just a representation of a representation of the real thing. And something is always going to be lost in translation. But it's a, it's a really great tool, especially for um, being made in the 1800s. I hope that helps. Thanks.